Well, good evening. We do welcome each one to this farewell service for the Reverend and Mrs. Patterson tonight. We do bid you all a very warm welcome, and we trust the Lord will bless us as we gather around His Word tonight. But if you have an order of service, we're going to begin, please, with the hymn number uh, seven in the hymn book, but on the hymn sheet here, to God be the glory, great things He had done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Let's stand as we sing and sing with all our hearts, to God be the glory place. Let's stand together. Come before the Lord in a word of prayer together, please. So let's have every head bowed and every eye closed as we still ourselves before the throne of grace. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee and praise Thee for the health and strength to be out of Thy house this Friday evening. And Father, we thank Thee that as we come, we come in the place of prayer, not unto any, any person or any individual that is finite, but we thank Thee that we come unto Thee, Jehovah God, 
We come unto the one that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We come unto the one that has proclaimed of himself, I change not. And we thank thee that there is none else beside thee. We praise thee that no matter what may go on in this world, no matter what may change, no matter what trials or heartaches or dismay may approach us, we praise thee that our God is steadfast and our God remains the same. And Father, thou knowest the subject that finds us in thy house tonight. And Father, we do pray that thou give us help in every aspect of this farewell gathering. Lord, we do especially thank thee tonight for the Reverend and Mrs. Patterson. We thank thee for the way thou hast been pleased to use them over ten years in this place. We thank thee for the faithfulness of our brother in particular from the pulpit week after week after week. And we do believe thy people have been edified and we believe that souls have been won to saving faith in Jesus Christ, even through the ministry of the word. And we thank thee for it. And we thank thee for the way in which thou hast laid thy hand of blessing upon our brother, even throughout his ministry in this place. And Lord, thou knowest that now we approach a time of change. And thou knowest there are all sorts of emotions that uh, are found within the hearts of thy people. Thou knowest that there is no doubt sorrow in the gathering tonight. Thou knowest there is that sorrow of parting. Thou knowest there is no doubt that, that anguish, that, that there is that separation. But nonetheless, there is also that excitement for future days as well. And Lord, we do pray that thou would undertake for the Reverend and Mrs. Patterson, even as they uh, start afresh in Market Hill, we pray that thou bless. We pray that thou would add unto our brother many souls, even as he labors for thee in that place. And we do pray that thou bless thy people, even in the kingdom of morn. We pray that thou comfort. We pray that thou help. And we pray that thou give thy divine wisdom and guidance, even in these times of vacancy that soon approach us. And we pray that in all things, we may be able to say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But, O oh God, we pray especially for tonight. We pray that thou help us to sing thy praises. We pray that thou help each one that will uh, give out a presentation. We pray that thou help us even in the place of prayer and with the reading of the scriptures. And then, Lord, we plead for thy blessing upon the preaching of divine truth. We ask that everything that is said and done tonight may be said and done to the glory of Christ, the sole King and Head of this church. For we ask these things in and through the Savior's lovely and most precious name. Amen. Now, turning in the Word of God together, please, to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29. And just as you're finding your place, let me just say, that uh, immediately after the service, if the session and committee could remain behind in the church here uh, for a photograph, and then for the rest of the congregation, there is going to be supper provided after the meeting. So everybody's very welcome to stay behind for that also. But let's read the Word of God together. Jeremiah chapter 29. We'll just read the verse 1. It gives us the background, and then we're going to uh, break into the portion again at the verse 8 and read down to the end of the verse 14. So Jeremiah chapter 29, if we found our place, let us read the word of God together. Jeremiah 29 verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Then the verse 8, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, this is the Lord speaking through Jeremiah now, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, 
and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. We trust the Lord to bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each of our hearts tonight. We're going to sing again, please, so if you take your order of service. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power through all the universe display. We'll stand as we sing again, singing to the glory of God together. Let's stand together.
Amen. Now at this point in the service, we have some presentations that we'd like to make and initially make some presentations to the Reverend Patterson and then to both Mr. and Mrs. Patterson. And then when all of that is uh, completed, we'll then ask the Reverend Patterson to come to the pulpit in a little while and respond and maybe give a few remarks. But that being said, we'll ask, uh, first of all, those coming up, I'll not name everybody, I'll just name uh, who they're coming up on behalf of, but we'll ask those coming up, representing the children's meeting, initially please, and ask Mr. Patterson if he would come up also and give that presentation. Well, thank you very much, Max and Luke. But then we'll ask uh, uh, Paul Hockey to come for the Sunday school, please. Very well done. And then ask on behalf of the Youth Fellowship, please, Mr. Emery and the ladies. What our brother didn't mention is before that youth weekend, Mr. Patterson had full head of hair, but um, we must go on. <laughs> we'll ask 
uh, Mr. Campbell to come up on behalf of Mon Missionary Trust, please. Um, as you know, the work of Mon Missionary Trust is not only the work of the bookshop, but also we have that desire to see the work of missions advance. And whenever the Reverend Patterson came, um, I'm not suggesting that our previous ministers didn't have this same missionary zeal, but he certainly did and was very much involved in the missionary endeavors of the church. I believe even then he was part of the mission board. And our brother uh, was therefore of a kindred spirit, as it were, and came with that desire to see uh, the work of the Trust advance. And we want to thank him for those, these t past 10 years, those times when he has chaired our meetings, when he has given advice, and when he has clearly shown his uh, desire to see the work of Beulah Bookshop and the whole work of the Trust advance. And brother, we do thank you for your help and your encouragement, even on a personal level, during these past 10 years. Often unannounced, Mr. Patterson would just come in and have a wee wander around the bookshop and to see what new books were even on the shelves. And we thank him for those times, and those times too, whenever Mrs. Patterson was able also to come along. I don't know if they were in Cafe Nero or not, but they were certainly in Costa del Newcastle, and we were very delighted to have them. You know, I was just thinking today that uh, Margaret Hill is more inland, so on a night like tonight, it's colder. So uh, if you want to get two or three degrees hotter, why not come to the bookshop in Newcastle? And if it's not any warmer outside, I can assure you that the welcome inside will certainly be very hearty and very warm indeed. So it is my privilege and my pleasure tonight on behalf of the Brethren and More Missionary Trust to present you with this lovely book, A Puritan Theology, Doctrine for Life. I trust that you don't have it on your shelf. The last few times I was in the study, I'm sure Mr. Patterson wondered why I was looking past them at the shelves, but that was just to see if I could maybe get, catch a glimpse of this book. But brother, if you do, they tell me the boy in the bookshop is very easy to deal with, and he'll maybe change it for you. But I trust you'll accept this gift. I was thinking of that verse in Genesis, Joseph is a fruitful bough whose branches run over the wall. And I trust that the Lord will make you as he was, fruitful spiritually in your labors for him in Margaret Hill. The Lord bless you. Thank you very much, brother. And now we're going to have some presentations to both the Reverend and Mrs. Patterson. So I'll ask uh, Joel Cousins and Ruby Morrison to come forward, and they're going to make a presentation on behalf of Mourn Independent Christian School Place. And I know that's a work that's very close to our brother's heart, and we trust the Lord to bless it even in times to come. But now we'll ask uh, Mr. Cunningham, Mrs. Graham to come forward and make a presentation on behalf of the church committee, please. Thank you. 
tonight. Uh, it's even harder, I feel, because it's a farewell service, and there's always a tent of sadness in a service like this. But uh, it's not my job. It's not my job to make a speech tonight. It's my job to pass this gift over to Reverend and Mrs. Patterson on behalf of our congregation. And I do would like to say I wish you all the best, and may the Lord truly and richly bless you now as you go to Margaret Hill. I wasn't going to make a speech, but I've just a couple of unawy things to say. Whenever I said at the start, a farewell service is always a sad time. Well, I do feel the night that it is a sad night, and especially this week, we're lost in our, our minister here. It's 10 years, but we've also lost a great man from this congregation, our brother George Clark Assession. And I'd just like to take this opportunity of uh, giving a word of sympathy to the family. And I do mourn with the McCollum family at this time. But also, looking back on, on my time in this church, all these have many a happy memory of her brother George. And he would have been up here speaking at these farewell services. And just, you wouldn't have known what he would have said, and he always had a wit and the right thing to say at the right time. And I just remember, I always remember this from a very young age. I'm not sure which of her ministers it was, but it was one of her farewell services. He was just about, his speech said, and he was about to sit down. And he just looked around at the minister, and he says, you know, brother, he says, you enlightened me the night till a big drum with no sides. You're going to be mighty hard to beat. And I know Reverend Patterson is among us enough a long time now, and he knows. He'll maybe not hear that from every pulpit, but he'll understand what that means. And just on a personal note now, I would just like to wish them all the best. And on behalf of myself and my family, and as a committee man, you'll be truly missed. Thank you very much, Bra, for those heartfelt, meaningful words. But now we're going to ask uh, our brother, Mr. Cunningham, to come forward. And he's just going to say a word on behalf of the session, the committee, and the congregation as a whole, please. Thank you, Bra. Well, there's not much left for me to say now. <laughs> Anyhow, we've reached uh, another milestone in our congregation. And it's good to see so many children and young people out tonight. <clears throat> and for the benefit of them, this separated witness here in the Kingdom of Morn. I came into existence 55 years ago for the preaching of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all down through them years, in spite of our unfaithfulness, in spite of our shortcomings, the Lord blessed us in a remarkable way. And tonight we stand here to give God all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. Reverend Patterson is our fifth minister. We've been blessed as we sat under his ministry. Souls have been saved and backsliders restored. He served the Lord faithfully in these 10 years. To us, it seemed a very short time, but maybe to him, 
It seemed long enough when he was dealing with boys like us. Uh, but, you know, some might say, why is our brother leaving at this time? <clears throat> well, we as a section and committee believe it's all in the plan of God. <clears throat> For God is sovereign, and the good man's steps are ordered by the Lord. And as, as we were thinking about these ten years, and remembering how our brother Patterson labored in all the meetings of our congregation, which you have already heard tonight, think of the day school, Bible class, prayer meetings, gospel services, children's meetings, and the youth fellowship and many committees in Presbytery. We can give thanks to the Lord tonight that he was faithful in every aspect of the work. And just at this stage, I would just like to read a few verses. And it's found in Psalm 119, and it's the verse 73. And while you're turning up the place, as I was thinking of 10 years, and the number 10 uh, was in my mind all week. And I believe the Lord led me to this section. And by the way, this is the 10th section of Psalm 119. And I think we can see the hand of God, even as we look at these verses. Read, uh, uh, look at them with me as we read from verse 73. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy commandments are right, and that thy unfaithfulness has afflicted me. Let I pray thee thy merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to thy word, unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they deal perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed." And I've already said, here we can see the hand of God, even in this verse 73. It says, thy hands have made me. So right away our attention is drawn to the Saviour's hand. The Saviour's hand, his gracious hand, his powerful hand, and his loving hand, which keeps the child of God all along his earthly way. And dear people, where would we be today if it was not for the hand of God in our lives? Look at the verse 73. that speaks there of the Ten Commandments. There is the number 10 again. And the summary of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind that we might learn them and obey them. And that's why our brother Patterson is moving to Margaret Hill. He's obeying the call of God. The number 10 has a, an association with our hands. You look at your hands, you're looking at number 10. Or the work of our hands. 10 is generally recognized to be the number of responsibility and to be the number of of accountability to God for the work of our hands. So not only can we see God's hand in this verse, but we can see our own hands. It says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. And tonight we can thank God that our brother Patterson believes that with all his heart. He believes in the God of creation. He believes that God 
created man, male and female, after his own image. And man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And you know, God's handiwork was not brought about by an accident or by some aimless event. Thank God that our brother preaches the whole counsel of God without fear or favor. And we can say that our brothers were those hands that pointed this congregation to Christ, the only Savior of the world. And every time he came into the pulpit, as he lifted up his hands, he was pointing to the Lamb of God, the one that taketh away the sin of the world. Look at verse 74. The verse 74, I think here we have a, a great word of encouragement for each one of us. We have a word of encouragement for the congregation and we have a word of encouragement for our brother Patterson. 74 says, They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. Verse 76 there speaks about the comfort. Look at verse 76. Let I pray thee, Thy merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to thy word unto thy servant. And what a comfort it is that we have the word of God to look back on and to lean upon and to stand upon the promises of God. What a comfort it is. You know, we have had times when we were downcast or troubled and some had to pass through sickness and sorrow, as our brother Andrew, Andrew mentioned tonight, we've been mourning just a few days ago for brother Clark of Session, and we have to pass this way. But God's word always brought us gladness to our hearts. Look at verse 77. It speaks there of thy law is my delight. And how we delight it in the law of God even as our brother preached from time to time, even in this congregation. And I want to quote that verse that our brother read tonight in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. For I know thy thoughts, which I think toward thee, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. What an end the child of God has. What an end we have Dear people, one day we'll see the King in all his glory. And there's a great hopeful future for the child of God. And our prayer is that the Lord will bless us here and bless our brother and his wife as they move to Margaret Hill. And when they're coming down to visit Stephen, they'll be made very welcome to drop in and visit us. And we pray that the Lord indeed will bless them mightily. And we can say with Romans 8 and verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Ephesians 1 and 11, it's according to the purposes of God who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And could we say finally to our brother Patterson and his wife, May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. We'd like to thank our brother for bringing that word on behalf of the session and the committee and the congregation. Now we're going to ask Sir Evan Patterson if he'll come up to the pulpit and maybe just bring a few words to us now. I want to take the opportunity of thanking each one for coming along tonight. And I know that it's an inclement evening uh, but we appreciate your attendance and your effort uh, to come out 
and especially if you're visiting, I have some visitors from other places, and indeed from the town itself, and we welcome each and every one in the Lord's name. We do want to thank those who are joining in through the media as well, and we pray that the Lord might bless you tonight. My uh, comments are uh, going to be few. Somebody says, that's a change. <laughs> but uh, I brought my Bible out tonight in the opening and I seen a pen stuck in here. There's a story behind that. I was at a function the other night and my button broke on my shirt. So I grabbed a pen to put it together, but it didn't stay together, you know. And then I stuck it into the Bible there and I forgot to take it out again. Well, that's how that's there. Men and women, uh, I appreciate your coming. I also am very thankful for all the presentations that have been made uh, this evening and for the kind gifts. And I will cherish these, and so will Cherie. And I was waiting on Max and Luke uh, breaking out a great speech at the very start uh, because I was in their houses last night and there was plenty of chatter to them. Uh, but right from the wee ones, right up uh, to our brother George, uh, we appreciate the kind words that have been expressed tonight and for the presentations that have been made. I want to say this, that uh, the privilege has been mine. And those are not just uh, fanciful words. Uh, I, I really uh, mean that. The privilege has been mine to minister unto the good people of Mourn. And Ten years has gone, and we ask, where have they gone to, really? Uh, it seems they've gone by very quickly, and yet there's been much has been squeezed into those ten years. And uh, we do thank God for his hand upon us and enabling us uh, during those ten years. Now, I'm not the longest to serve. Uh, that record is still held by the Reverend Ferguson. I'd probably come in uh, second alongside the Reverend Mercer. But I do have a record. I'm the oldest. <laughs> I'm the oldest serving minister uh, that you've ever had. And I was chatting to Reverend Ferguson the other day, and I just wanted to clarify what age he was when he left for London. And it was younger than I am now. Uh, so that tells you something, that you have young men uh, in the pulpit, uh, usually. Uh, but it's been my privilege, and I want to thank God tonight uh, for the works that have been represented, but I commence by thanking the Lord for my elders. And uh, I, I have been greatly privileged in serving with these men. I, I was saying to our brother behind me that uh, I could call on five or six men and they could give a word, and you've heard our brother George Cunningham tonight and expounding the scriptures. And I know any time that I wasn't here for a prayer meeting, and he took it, or R.G. Graham took it, or Brother Book George took it, or Ian took it, there's always many that come in and listened uh, to the word online. And there was always a word in season. And the other men are the same. And I appreciate uh, the men that the Lord has given me, uh, even as the eldership in this church. And I uh, thank God for them. And their great wisdom. And their... Uh, working alongside me and, and guiding and directing and, and even at times uh, putting the brakes on and that's necessary as well and uh, we thank God uh, for these men and I know uh, that words have been said regarding this week and uh, men and women I want to say that I, I don't feel that I, my name can be in the same bracket of jo as George McConnell at Lurk of Session and I have the highest esteem for the two Georges, three Georges, four Georges. But uh, clerk of session was very dear, not only to the congregation, but to me. And I remember over 10 years ago, he phoned the manse, and we had a chat on the phone. Um, I had already expressed to the interim moderator then that I had no leading. And uh, George had a wee chat with me, and I had a chat with him. Uh, I was just... Um, friend a friend and he left that phone call saying you know the congregation might meet anyway and of course uh, they did about four months later uh, in the month of August and uh, I, I ended up uh, receiving the call and being the minister here 10 years ago 
And I appreciate George's counsel over the years. And he has finished his course uh, just on earth the last Sunday morning. And it was my last Sabbath here as a minister in the pulpit. And for him, it is uh, much better. He's seen the king in all his beauty. And dear people, if you're not saved, still my prayer that you'll join us one day. There'll be a great reunion, you know. And we'll see Christ, the one who loved us, and gave himself for us. And uh, I do pray on for the family. That the Lord might give uh, help in the coming days. So I do thank the Lord for our elders. And I've seen that eldership increase. And young men have come in and capable and good men, good godly men. And I pray the Lord's blessing to be upon them each one. Uh, right from the most senior uh, to the youngest in the days ahead. I do also thank the Lord for the various committees. Um, we have served with two or three committees over those years. And the men, I appreciate them. And I, I believe there's a good body of men there now as well uh, to take the work forward. And I pray the Lord might bless and guide them in coming days. And I want to uh, thank God for the many godly people that I have met, many of whom are in the glory tonight. And I don't know, some of you will remember, uh, but it was a uh, difficult uh, baptism at the start when I came because we had four funerals just one after another. And uh, that, was, that was difficult. That was difficult for the families. But, you know, uh, we thank God for those people that we have met and we've grown to love. Uh, men, men like we Norman. Um, we, we cherish him with Alan today. And we always have great times of fellowship there. Uh, Molly. I arrived on Molly's 90th birthday. Um, we, we phoned her. And Molly was a great uh, support to me uh, down through the years. And there's many another. It would be unfair for me to name because I leave some out. Uh, but I do thank God uh, for the people that have come across our path. And I've been privileged to work with not only those in glory, but those that are still here today. And I knew maybe they didn't get out, but they were praying for me. And they were in their homes faithfully praying. And uh, what, a, what an encouragement, what a comfort that is uh, to the preacher, uh, that the people of God are praying and holding us before the throne. I thank God for our youth. And as has really been intimated tonight, uh, I, I enjoy going to the youth, taking a little part there, and for the Youth Fellowship Weekends. And Gordy has mentioned one of them, and there were many others. Uh, I remember one that sticks out in my memory, of course, too, at a wedding that day, and the old vertigo kicked in that night, and I got Cherie to drive up from the hotel to the Youth Fellowship weekend. And there's me staggering into this place uh, on a Friday night, coming from a hotel, coming from a wedding, and uh, hitting the bed uh, with the vertigo, I had to lie down. But you know, the Lord was good, and the next morning it was as clear as a bell. And uh, we were able to enjoy the fellowship with the young people uh, that weekend as well in Portadown. And uh, the Lord has given us good young people. I mean that. Um, we have a wee transition at the minute. They're a lot younger, but they're a good group of, you, of young people. And young people in fellowship, I want you to make sure you see your sister Emma, because I have a little book for each one of you uh, that I want you to have uh, just as a little momentum uh, from me and from uh, our final night here. And so our sister Emma will give them uh, to you if you go to her in the coming days or nights. Another thing that lies close to us, and, uh, and um, I should speak about Ian's shop as well, MMT. Of course, that lies close to any preacher where there's books. Uh, it's always good to go in and to see uh, what's on the, the bookshelves. But it is a school. And I, I thank God for our Christian school. And I wish that some parents would be able to follow Mrs. Campbell and our teachers uh, just for a day. 
Uh, and I'll tell you, you'll not need to go to the gym at night. Uh, and they're doing a great work. And we need to appreciate it. We need to appreciate it. We've lost one school already this year. That's a warning. And I don't want to see any more lost. And I pray in coming days that I'll hear of the increase. And I pray in coming days I'll hear of a preschool being opened in the will of God here on, in Mourn. Because I still feel there's a need for that. But you pray on for the work of the school. That parents' hearts will be touched in the area, in the community. The school is not only for free Presbyterian children, as you know, but it has extended uh, to all, all, all sorts who have come in over the years. And it's my prayer that those chairs again will be filled up by pupils. And we have the staff uh, to teach them and to teach them well. And I thank God for achievements and marks that have been achieved over the years. And so uh, I, I say to uh, Mrs. Campbell and to the teachers, and it's good to see Rebecca here tonight too, we'll be praying for you. And uh, we'll be praying for every aspect of the work. And may the Lord bless in coming days. Now I know my friend behind me is going to bring a word tonight, but I, I just wanted to read a couple of verses. And there's 2 Timothy 2. And 2 Timothy 2 is Paul writing to his young son in the faith, young minister. And Paul was near in the end, of course, of his, of his ministry on earth. But he had these words to say, Verse 1, Now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. I therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You see, men and women, there's a principle there. Verse 2. And the principle is simply this. That Paul taught them. God taught him. But he taught them. That they might teach others. And if you've been blessed through my ministry this last ten years, it's because God has taught me. And he's given me a word. And I want you to take that word and to teach others. That's, that's the, way, the manner in which God's word goes forth. That's the manner in which God's work is done. It's not through gimmicks. It's through the word. been preached. And I thank God for, for, for those whom the Lord has given unto our ministry. And some of you have been saved during the last ten years. And I rejoice in that. Some of you have backslidden. And you've been restored. And some of you have been edified. And some of you brought in of late. And you're enjoying the fellowship. And that, re that rejoices my heart. But you read that verse again. We're to teach others also. We're to hand on the gospel. Not only to the wee ones and to the young people. But others as well. There's a price. Because the next verse goes on to say... Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. And the soldier has a price. And the soldier has to make sacrifice. But he endures that hardness. And he spends time. How are you going to teach others if you don't spend time with the Lord? And Paul spent time with the Lord. And he's able to impart the teaching that he taught and that's how we can be effective witnesses for Christ in these days. We spend time at the Savior's feet. The price has to be paid. No shortcuts. There, there, there's no substitutes. We need to spend time with the Lord. To be taught of Him. And you know, there's also the person. Because you'll notice also there... In verse 4, no man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him. 
who had chosen him to be a soldier. What's her motivation? What's her objective? It is to please Christ, the person of Christ. And I point you again to him tonight. I can do no one else. And I pray even yet when I'm long gone that God might speak on and I'll hear news of souls been saved and mourned. Souls again been restored. And God's people been edified. We want to please the Master. We want to please Christ. I believe our late clerk of session has heard that. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that's our prayer for every one of God's people this evening. I thank you. I thank you sincerely tonight on behalf of Sheree as well. And of course, we're, we're leaving a bit of us behind as well. We have a couple up at the top of the country and now we're leaving Stephen down the bottom of the country. Uh, so I know you'll look after him. Not that he needs looked after, but you know what I mean. And uh, we'll be encouraged to hear uh, of the work of God going on in the kingdom of morn. If you can stay for a wee cup of tea afterwards, I welcome you and I'll be able to have a wee chat with you. If you can't understand, uh, I completely understand. But I just thank you again for coming tonight. And men and women, listen, the best is yet to come. I believe that. The best is yet to come. Dr. Paisley often said that, didn't he? The end is not yet. The best is yet to come. And I believe that's the case for morn. And you'll have a better man in God's time. Stand here. And take the work again forward for his glory. God bless you. Well, we would like to thank the Reverend Patterson for those words. <clears throat> After the service tonight, maybe ask the Reverend Mrs. Patterson if they would go to the door and then each one will be able to see them just at the close of the service. But we're going to sing again at this point, please. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me has been made known, nor why unworthy as I am he claimed me for his own. And what a chorus this is. Literally sing it from the depths of our heart, this lovely hymn, I know not why God's wondrous grace. <clears throat> Let's stand together.
Amen. Wonderful singing yet again. Now we're turning in God's Word together, please, to Jeremiah chapter 29. I promise we'll not be long tonight. Just a wee devotional, really. But Jeremiah chapter 29, I must be honest that throughout this week, since I found out I had to preach tonight, (laughs) that I was asking the Lord for a text. Didn't know what to preach, to be honest, because such an occasion has a mixture of emotions. Obviously, the sorrow there. Also, there's excitement for our brother heading over to Market Hill. There's all sorts of different emotions going through our minds. And yet I believe the Lord has directed my steps to Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. And I was glad when our brother was speaking and almost confirmed that message to my own heart that this was the word for tonight, just for a moment or two. Jeremiah 29 verse 11, the word of God states, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. We're looking at the thoughts of God tonight briefly. But with the word of God open before us, let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer, please. Let's ask for the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, we still ourselves in thy presence now. O God, speak of the voice that wakes the dead. And make thy people hear, we plead. Undertake for the need. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when we come to any portion of Scripture, we always need to ask ourselves, well, what's the background? What's the context? What's the history to Jeremiah chapter 29 and the verse 11? And with that being said, I want you all to flicker a few pages back to chapter 17. Chapter 17 of Jeremiah sums up, really, the history of that verse. Because we find initially that Jeremiah is preaching, warning that if Judah do not turn from their sin, the judgment will come. A Babylonian captivity will come. And we see the problem, the problem here, why Jeremiah has to preach through the power of the Holy Spirit and the way he does in chapter 17, verse 9. It states there, if you're looking at the verse, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Then look at the verse 23 of that same chapter. It says concerning the people of Judah, But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. Then turn back towards chapter 25 with me, if you would, because we find there wasn't just the issue of sin in Judah, sin in the heart. And that's not only Judah's condition, but that's our condition tonight. If you don't have Christ, then friend, you're a sinner. And the judgment of God is is coming, and it's coming thick and fast if you don't repent. And what we see in chapter 25 in the verse 4 is that because of Judah's sin, God sent a man. God sent a messenger. And it says in chapter 25, verse 4, And the Lord had sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. Now let me stop there a moment, and let me say, for the last ten years, Almighty God has given you a prophet, has given you a preacher, has given you an evangelist, has given you a man that week after week after week after week has warned you concerning your sin, just like Jeremiah was warning the people of Judah of their sin. And look what it says in the verse 5. The same words that the Reverend Patterson has proclaimed from this very pulpit, Sunday after Sunday. And they said, turn ye again now, everyone from his evil way, and from the evil of your doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you, and to your fathers forever and ever. I wonder, my friend, and this is just a short challenge. We're not going to spend long on this tonight, but the challenge is this. I wonder, do you know that you're a sinner? Do you know that you've rebelled against God? You've transgressed God's commandments, and God has sent you a preacher, an evangelist, and has pleaded with your soul for 10 years now, asking, friend, when will you turn to Christ? 
And maybe you're just like the people in the verse 7. Look at it with me, please. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord. I know it's been the prayer of our brother for the ten years he's been here that souls will be saved. And I'm sure, like in every other congregation, like Monish Lane being no different, that I'm sure there are people that he has preached to from day one, and even on his last Sunday, last Lord's Day, he preached to your soul yet again. And he's pleaded with you. And he's cried to God for you. And he's tried to expound the gospel as plainly and clearly to you as possible. But still, after ten long years, you're outside of Christ. I know our brother would know no greater joy than to see you saved tonight. I'm sure there are some in this gathering, and yet you don't yet know the Savior. My friend, come to the Savior and make no delay. But then come back with me to the text. Uh, and look at chapter 29 and the verse 10. Now we find here that ultimately, because Judah has sinned, because God has given them warning after warning after warning, then God has no other choice but to rain down judgment upon them. That's what he does. A 70-year captivity. The Babylonians come in. They take them away as slaves. Jerusalem is made desolate. Judah is destroyed largely. And we find that for 70 years they're under the judgment of God. And it says that in the verse 10 of chapter 29. For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished a Babylon. Judgment is there. Judgment is coming. But you see what I want to leave with you tonight just as a wee thought is this. The same we thought that Habakkuk gave in Habakkuk 3 verse 2, that in wrath the Lord remembered mercy. That still he had a word of encouragement, a word to their souls. And I trust, even as our brother quoted it, it isn't just a word for Judah, but it's a word for the kingdom of Mourn tonight as well. Look at the verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Isn't that astonishing? These rebellious people, these people that, that had no time for God, these people that, like the psalmist could describe, were a fool that said, no God for me, no God for me. Well, we find that still the Lord had a word for these people and said, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And just three very wee thoughts, and they will be we. Number one. The Lord thinks about us. The Lord thinks about us. Now that is something that ought to never grow old. Friend, the Lord thinks about us. When we think who God is, he's the creator. He's the omnipotent God. He's the omniscient God. He's the omnipresent God. He's the sovereign God. He is the God that is the righteous God, the sinless God. He is a God that has every right to think evil thoughts about us. He is the God that is, has the right and the divine prerogative to think revengeful thoughts against us. And yet what does it say? He thinks thoughts, not thoughts only, but thoughts of peace and not of evil isn't it amazing to think God thinks about us and whatever you're going through whether it's sorrow of heart even at this time of farewell understand this the Lord knows and the Lord cares about it and the Lord feels it too and even for our brother and sisters they, they move on to Market Hill and and there is naturally that excitement but no doubt also that anxiety of a new start and and all of those things well the Lord knows about that too what a truth that is, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Come with me to Psalm 40, please. Psalm 40 in the verse 5. I want to encourage you in this, that God doesn't just think about you, but friend, God thinks about you all of the time. There isn't a date, there isn't an hour, there isn't a second goes by when the Lord ceases to think about you. The Lord is always constantly thinking about you. You are constantly on the mind of God. And it says in Psalm 40 in the verse 5, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. And look at this now. If you're in the habit, you can mark it in your Bible. And thy thoughts, thy thoughts which are to usward. Let's go back to the start of the verse. Many, O Lord my God, are, and look at it now, thy thoughts which are to usward. And it says, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. 
Isn't that incredible to think that at our time of sorrow, at our time of dismay maybe, at our time of parting, we know that the Lord not only thinks about us, but constantly thinks about us. And if you were to try and add up how many times God thought about us, then you couldn't count or put a number upon it. Isn't that incredible? But then the second we thought, not only that the Lord thinks about us, but number two, the Lord's thoughts of peace. Because look at the verse again, our text, chapter 29 of Jeremiah, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Look at it now. Astonishing words, really. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. Now, as I've already said, the Lord had every right to seek revenge against us. We are a rebellious people, a sinful people, a a, a lawless people, a commandment-breaking people, spiritual convicts in the sight of God, and yet the one who had every right to seek revenge and wrath upon us, no, this God, he has thoughts of peace and not of evil toward us. And tonight we can remember that, that whatever we are feeling, the Lord has thoughts of peace toward us. And ultimately we see that in the cross. We see that in the blood that was shed, but God commendeth his love toward us. And the Lord was under no misconception as to who we were. He knew exactly who we were, in that why we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. You see, the Lord thinks about us, but at this time of sorrow, I want you to note this. The Lord not only thinks about you, but he thinks thoughts of peace as well. But then, number three, the expected end. The expected end. Look at the verse again. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, a brother touched on this. I was glad he didn't steal the wee thought in my sermon. I thought he was going to. But of course, all of us that are children of the king, we know we have a wonderful expected end, end, heaven's glory, the kingdom of God, all of those wonderful expectations and hope in the blood of Christ. But I want you to note that our expected end isn't just what we expect in the glory. One last reference, Deuteronomy 31, and I want you to come there with me, please. Deuteronomy 31 and the verse 8. You may say, well, preacher, What is our expected end? Well, we come to this farewell service and we know to a degree what our expected end is for the immediate future. Our brother goes to Market Hill and we remember him in our prayers that the Lord would save many a soul through him and see the people of God there edified. For us now in this congregation at a time of vacancy when we go forward asking for the Lord's help, But you know, my friend, Deuteronomy 31 and the verse 8 tells us that we needn't fear because the Lord has a divine decree and our expected end, it won't change, it won't alter, but the Lord is going to take us there and direct us every step of the way until we pass through the pearly gates. And it says in verse 8, and the Lord, he it is that doth go with thee. And if we can finish on a final thought, it'd be this. Whatever we face tomorrow, Whatever we face in 12 months' time, whatever we face in another 10 years' time, well, let us remember this. The Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. And what a truth this is now. Are you ready for it? He will not fail thee. Isn't it amazing? I know I will fail at times as interim moderator in this place. I I know that. I'm a man. I'm a a sinful man at that. I'll fail you. I know our brother here, he can say he he fails at times. Men will fail you, but the Lord will not fail us. He will not fail thee. But look at this next phrase, neither forsake thee. Isn't that wonderful? There'll never be a time when the Lord stops thinking about us, but further to that, there'll never be a time when he leaves us without his presence. And then what else does it say? So on the ground and basis of this, that the Lord goes before you, friend, And the Lord will not fail you, and the Lord will not forsake you. Then remember this, fear not, fear not, neither be dismayed. So I want to leave this with you, friend. Whatever our emotions, whatever our dismay, anxiety for the future, whatever it is we face tonight, let us remember this, that the Lord cares, and the Lord knows all about it. 
And friend, if you're not saved, then I tell you this, there'd be no greater joy for our brother here at his very last meeting here as minister. There'd be no greater joy for him to spend that little time staying behind and pointing you to the Savior he sought to preach for so long from this pulpit. And I know if you're saved tonight, then not only will there be rejoicing in the kingdom of Mormon, but there'll be rejoicing in the whole of the kingdom of heaven. For the scriptures say that the angels are looking into these things and waiting and longing. So there's great rejoicing in the whole of heaven over one sinner that rejoice, uh, uh, repenteth. But the verse 11, let us, let us close on these thoughts. Whatever our thoughts may be, God knows. God cares. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. We trust the Lord to bless these few thoughts to each of our hearts for his own namesake. We're going to sing again our last hymn on the order of service, please. And let's make this not only our closing hymn, but let's also make it a prayer from the heart. Revive thy work, O Lord. Thy mighty arm make bare. Speak with a voice that wakes the dead and make thy people here. Let's stand as we sing, and let's really sing it out. Revive thy work, O Lord. Let's stand together. Father, we make it our petition tonight, revive thy work, O Lord. Revive thy work in the free church. Revive thy work here in the kingdom of Morn. Revive thy work in Market Hill and Money Slain and 
Wherever else the word of God is faithfully preached, Lord, revive thy work, we plead. The Lord undertake for the Reverend and Mrs. Patterson at this time. We pray that thou guide thy footsteps, their footsteps, guide the steps of this congregation. We pray that together we may move forward to the glory of God alone. The Lord bless the supper, bless the hands that have prepared it. And we pray, help us to enjoy our fellowship in Christ tonight. For we ask these things in and through the Savior's lovely name. Amen.